All right, hello everybody. Welcome, this is CLS 2300, Families and Kinships in the Americas, right? And we are so excited because today we are going to be providing our uh, presentations, our research that we've been working on for quite some time. Over the past few weeks, groups have been coming together on different topics um, and looking at you know, viewpoints and experiences that different families in Chicanx and Latinx folks, right, have been experiencing. And so without uh, further ado, I'd like to go ahead and begin with our first group presentation, which is the LGBTQIA group. So go ahead and, and take it away from here. So our topic is LGBT families chosen, and I'm Andrea Diaz. Oh, I'm Calvin Gamboa. My name is Julie I'm Garcia. I'm Isaias Pestaña. My name is Steve Gomez. Uh, My name is Monica Topete. And I'm Cassandra Barajas. So for our cultural project, we did a collage and basically just putting up our three major topics uh, into one, which were religion, machismo, and gender roles, and uh, stereotypes. So for this one, I decided to put uh, pecado in bold just because um, every time we talk about, uh, you know, one's sexuality or um, what you identify it as, um, many religious Hispanics uh, say that it's pecado because of their religion. Um, another thing that we talked about in religion was marriage, about how um, the Catholic Church and Christian Church don't really um, approve of uh, same-sex marriage. Um, we also talked about some stereotypes that um, the Hispanic community have when identifying a gay man or a gay woman, you know, uh, in terms of when you identify a gay uh, woman, um, a Hispanic community tends to lean more into the side of like, oh, um, Hispanic women have short hair and they dress in men's clothing and they talk very aggressively. And for gay men, they say that gay men um, walk in a certain way or they do their makeup or they talk in high pitched voices and um, as well as gender roles in terms that, you know, women are expected uh, to be as stay, uh, stay at home moms and be submissive towards men, um, as well as women being able to show emotions compared to men who are supposed to be kind of like the homebody and like the strong one in the family. And that's kind of what we wanted to put in this collage and stuff. Yeah. So some things that LGBTQ people face, such as challenges and stereotypes, are that people people have certain, as, certain um, interpretations of what they are. Some of them are like LGBTQ People are violent and murderous, do not have religion, are overdramatic and emotional, creative, tend to be arts and drama classes. They're open and outgoing. And for some reason, there's this quote that's pretty famous even on social media when they all say that they are, they are all Karens and they also seek attention. <clears throat> some of these are all stereotypes. And the challenges that these stereotypes come with is that they tend to lose home support, they, they tend to get family rejected, home, home isolation, discriminated by their own family members, or not being safe in a home order and risk of homelessness. <clears throat> it is important to, to know that these challenges and stereotypes can really harm an individual, especially when it comes to cert certain types of cultures, as for example, my culture, my dad was a very machista person, and he would, he would actually Ask, tell me certain things when I acted a certain way that, that he, he believed I shouldn't act in, in his way, which I found very interesting now that I'm grown and I, I understand certain, certain roles and expectations of different cultures. <clears throat> and and after, after doing research on LGBTQ and families, I, I, I realized that it's important for us to, to realize that it's a, to accept, acceptance can save people's lives. 
which which means start listening, be affirming, have having empathy, educate yourself on all the all the um, aspects of either a man or woman's <clears throat> sexual orientation, take responsibility and to commit to doing better. <clears throat> and and something that stood out to me that I that I found when reading this in an article was that the ultimate goal is that we all have to become champions for all forms of diversity, including race, gender, and identity, sexual orientation, and your diversity to be to have a better and understanding world. So this uh, this slide is about a short film that I watched, uh, Hijo Prodijo. And in this short film, it's a main character, a Latinx uh, male, and he visits home from college. And during dinner, he starts talking about his friend, uh, his like long-term friend, Diego. And uh, as soon as they bring him up, he, his parents are like, oh, that's not good people because they know, the word gets around that, that he is a part of the LGBTQ plus. And right away they start saying like, oh yeah, he's, it's a sin that God doesn't accept of them. And then he gets mad and they don't realize that he, they just thought that he was bringing him up as his friend, but that was actually his boyfriend. And he felt that he wasn't welcome at home. So I'll go ahead and be talking about a film called Moonlight. And this film looks at three defining chapters in the life of Chi Rong, a young queer black man growing up in Miami. He as well feels annihilated from the world around him that he can see himself as he is. But his epic journey to manhood is guided by kindness, support, and love of the community that helps raise him. As well, there's a series called Pose about New York City, African American and Latino, LGBTQ and gender non-conforming drug ball culture, drag ball culture seen in the 1980s and in the early 1990s. So for the people that we interviewed in our oral history project, Monica Topete interviewed her mother, Clementine Topete, Stephen Gomez interviewed his sister, Elizabeth Gomez, Andrea Diaz interviewed her father, Eduardo Diaz, Calvin Gambos interviewed his father, Julie Garcia and it also interviewed her father, Jose Garcia. I interviewed my mother, Janet Rutia. Karen interviewed her grandmother and Isaiah interviewed a close family friend, Michelle Perez. So I'll be speaking about religion. So in the Latinx families, many families are religion driven. So um, many religions viewed LGBT as a sin, which made many Latinx family members that are part of the LGBT community stay inside the closet. Um, since they were really afraid of what their families were gonna say throughout the years, families have become more open-minded about the LGBT members. And then if their religion believes otherwise, many that teen members have been finding new ways and paths on their own spiritual beliefs and their Catholic faith. When we take a look at the history of the LGBTQ community, it has been a painful journey, yet they still continue to strive. And what's helped them throughout this journey have been big turning points and figures, such as the Stonewall riots, which was a police raid that's part the, the riots within the LGBTQ community to fight for their own rights, to fight for their own freedoms. And since then, we've had multiple figures pop up in this community, such as Silvia Rivera, Frida Kahlo, and Nancy Cardenas. They have all have done work on based around the LGBT community and trying to help them gain confidence in like coming out in, some, in some, some, some sort of way. Machismo, machismo is a word in Latin culture and macho means being manly. Uh, machismo uh, means a strong or exaggerated sense of manliness and assumative attitude that really encourage strength and entitlement to dominance or attributes of masculinity. Machismo also ties into gender roles. Um, for men, the role um, is being a breadwinner slash provider, hard worker, having no fear, being strong, independent, leader, power, enforced discipline. And for women is being vulnerable, weak, submissive, responsible for children and responsible for cooking and cleaning. Gender roles oppress men and women. If you do not meet these standards, 
you are not viewed as enough. This can lead to violence or death. Um, the LGBTQ community are oppressed by these ideas. And that concludes our presentation. Our presentation. All right, excellent. Let's give snaps and applause. Wonderful work. Thank you so much. That was just incredibly, like, I mean, just at a bar, but thank you so much. It's very, very informative. Appreciate it. All right, let's go ahead and move into our next group. Again, being mindful, everybody, right? We're on a 10 minute mark. So I just want to make sure that we, uh, we're mindful of that. Let's go ahead and hop to our mixed status transnational family group. Good afternoon. Our topic is mixed status families and separation and transnationalism. Um, okay, can we go to the next slide? I guess we'll introduce ourselves on our individual slides. I'm Karen and I'm going to be doing the history of the subject. A transnational family or family in separation can be described as a family that exists in two or more countries being separated by international borders. For Latinx folks in the United States, it can be argued that transnational families surged in existence in the 1940s with the Bracero program, as this meant that many men would be separated from their families for extended periods of time in order to work in the United States. There is a steady rise in transnational families across the past several decades as the need for immigration persists and the advancing militarization of migration continues. We can also see another rise beginning in the 1980s at approximately the same time that massive migration of Salvadorans began. The United States changed its contemporary migration enforcement policies, no longer focusing on only relatively inconsequential apprehensions at the border, the Reagan administration militarized border enforcement. This shows how migration is shaped both by family members leaving their country of origin as well as their inability due to U.S. legislation to return to said country or reunite with their family in the United States. My name is Jocelyn and I'm going to be presenting the oral history projects. For Israel's oral history project, it was about his dad and his experience migrating to the U.S. For Miguel's oral history project, it was about his dad as well migrating to the U.S. out of curiosity and materialistic resources. For Karen's interview, she interviewed her father and her mother, Eduardo and Yolanda Escobar, and they both reflect the idea of transnational families and migration due to poverty as well as prolonged pathways to citizenship. Um, for Alvin's interview, he interviewed his friend's father, who migrated three times at a very young age. For Alma's interview, she interviewed her parents to share their story living in poverty conditions in Mexico and pursued to live a better life in the U.S. as immigrants. Being transnational parents, they kept contact with their families to stay connected. For DeRay's oral history project, she interviewed her client, who is a Holocaust survivor. He migrated to the U.S. after he spent two years in the hospital recovering from the Nazis' brutality, torturing him and forever being separated from his family. And for my oral history project, I interviewed my aunt Angelica, who experienced family separation at a young age, but throughout the years stayed connected with her family. Okay, so for our cultural production, my name is Dara, and um, basically our memes are showing that um, the closer, for the first meme, it, there's a border in between, but um, you know nothing man-made can actually separate the love that we share with each other. Um, it's unfortunate that um, there are borders created to separate us. Um, in the middle, as you guys can see that um, the top part shows that there are families waving goodbye off of a train and then on the bottom portion there is a um, like a border against separating uh, families and they look pretty sad uh, you know because they can't see their loved ones um, on the last one um, is 1939 which is the holocaust and then 2021 which is also the detention centers off the border and um, basically the means want to parallel with each other showing that transnationalism and separation of families can um, basically create harm. And mainly, they're, they're mainly um, targeting poverty, um, you know, people in poverty and stuff like that. So, yeah, we just wanted to illustrate to you guys that, um, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. And I hope that um, 
our memes illustrate that for you. Next, please. So hello everyone, I'll be talking about, uh, my name is Israel, I'll be talking about transnational families slash parents. So um, transnational families are families that live in different countries. Often they become separated because the situation back home, um, most of the time the parents, children, whoever had to um, leave in order to find work or you know, provide for more for the family. Now transnational parents refer to the parents who leave um, their children behind, their family behind in their um, home country so they can find work. Um, some of the challenges presented to transnational parents is staying connected with their kids. Now in the past, um, it was a bit more difficult um, before the phone was invented because they had to um, either communicate through letters or they had or the children had to wait till their parents came home. But um, modern technology has allowed um, you know more parents to stay connected with the kids. But even then, there's still some challenges presented. Um, um, some kids end up resenting their parents because they felt they had been um, separated for too long. Some of them are still too young to understand why their um, parents left them and so on. But there's also a great deal of resilience as in like, as children get older, as parents, you know, get older, um, they start to, um, they remind themselves as to why they had to leave, you know, because the situation back home um, didn't allow them to to survive pretty much. And, um, you know, and so um, next slide. Yeah, next slide. Uh, so my name is Alvin Sanchez, and I'll be presenting on gender roles of transnational families. There are big differences when deciding who migrates and who stays behind in their home country. It was assumed that women migrated for family reunification, while men migrated for employment. During th this day and age, there are more cases where more women migrate for education than men while still seeking family reunification. It's important to also consider that migration does not only consider women and men. Boys and girls also migrate in high numbers. Children are most often accompanied by one of the parents and guardian or they either come alone. Most of these children come in several ways, such as being smuggled, trafficked, or even seeking asylum. These are the sacrifices and realities transnational families undertake for their children and families. There are... Hello everyone, my name is Alma and my, my topic will focus on cultural realities for transnational people. As transnational families living in the US, some of cultural traditions and ancestry practices can change because of different social structure and influences of peers, such as being introduced to new foods and other such practices. To connect to the families, transnational individuals still celebrate events such as Hispanic Heritage Month or Cinco de Mayo to follow the cultures, as well as eat Hispanic foods, which lend opportunity to open many Mexican business restaurants in the U.S. Due to the language and education level in the U.S. affects most transnational people because it forms class differences and equality. Through sports, music, and food are forms of Latino culture areas that had the greatest influence in the U.S. Although the diversity cultural practices is not well understood in the U.S., such as having different clothing style and other forms of ancestry practices, reality is because of the new generation, um, different cultures can be left behind and not as practice um, to their um, other country. Next. Hi, my name is Miguel and I'll be speaking on class. When talking about class, we must first look at the definition of what class is. And the class is a division of a society based on a social and economic status. Uh, now, this could differ based on living conditions and environment that one is in. Um, for example, if a person lives in a low-income community, they will be deemed low-income themselves. And uh, within transnational families, we can see class playing a role in these people's lives, seeing as most of these people who migrate to the U.S. come from poverty and migrate for financial reasons or to help better the lives of the families that they leave behind. 
and uh, financial stability is a key motivation for most of these migrants or individuals um, and within transnational families uh, financial stability is a key necessity to financially aid uh, the families back home and to an extent uh, keep them in a stable social class uh, this class being better than the living conditions that they were in um, Um, I'm going to do economics. My name is Taylor. And uh, mixed status transnational families have always suffered when it comes to, to um, economics and their, their money because that's mostly the reason that they, they end up having to be a mixed I mean, a transnational family <clears throat> because some of them have to leave to, to come to the U.S. and to, to be able to provide for their children because they can't find um, like they can't find suitable jobs in their home countries. So they decide to to come to the U.S. and then most of them find out that it's pretty much the same, more or less, because it, it's a it's a lot more expensive to live here, and most of the money that they do make, they end up sending it back. And um, some mixed families are actually able to receive stimulus checks now. So I mean, I I guess they could they, as long as they they um, pay taxes, even though they're they're not um, documented they will start to receive stimulus checks as of the last round. And um, d despite having m missed out on the first two checks that, that have came out, they are now able to, to um, get a lot of other government helps because of the COVID pandemic. And um, <clears throat> children who even come to the US by themselves who seek asylum also receive help from the government, like food, shelter, blankets, and even toys. And some of the, like while they're waiting for their parents to pick them up, they can even be given uh, some type of education while they're while they're waiting. And this type this type of help was was not available for them some ten or twelve years ago because things were very different back then. And now it looks like things are getting a little bit better for it for transnational families. Next, and that concludes our presentation. All right, excellent. Snaps, claps, all that good stuff, right? From your colleagues, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Let's go ahead and hop quickly to our next group, immigration and education. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our group will be discussing immigration and education, specifically its impacts on families. Our group consists of Angelica, Natalie, Rosalinda, Mirna, Leslie, Misael, and Ifran. Hey guys, good afternoon. I'm Natalie. One second, guys. Sorry, my dog. So throughout the course of this, throughout the time of this course, we learned about education and immigration. We read two books that covered the topic in I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter by Erica Sanchez. The author describes the story of Julia who is going through her own journey as she tries to mend her relationship with her parents. She is trying to figure out her self-identity and also pursue a higher education. In the other book, The Distance Between Us by Reina Grande, Reina comes from a poor lower income family where she faces abuse and um, in uncomfortable situations with her parents. Throughout that whole journey, she is still trying to pursue a higher education and she eventually goes on to graduate from college. So one thing that we can learn from this is that the education experience of immigrant families is unique to them as we face a lot of challenges throughout that journey, such as the ability to pay for, for school, resources, stress, fear of failure, confusion, and self-expression. One of the primary forms of empowerment present in immigration and education is being able to take control of their life to better their future. Many parents and individuals come to the U.S. to have a better life and better opportunities. In many cases, especially for children of immigrants, a higher education empowers them to strive ahead and acknowledge the sacrifices that their parents have made. Immigrants and their families show resilience in paving their path in a foreign country that they have very little knowledge about. 
They also show resilience in exceeding expectations placed on them, fighting social norms, and finding their place in a world where their culture and American culture clash. In CLS 2300, Families in the Americas, we have reviewed a lot of material that showcases the resilience and empowerment in families, especially in the readings The Distance Between Us by Reina Grande and I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter by Erika Sanchez. Hello everyone, here we have some pictures next to our interviewees that we decided to share with the class. For our oral history projects, we all interviewed different family members that consist of parents, uncle, and sister. All of our interviewees come to the U.S. to gain the ability for a better life. Through their journey, education was never set a priority. They come chasing the American dream, which typically means hardworking hours to support their families. They are, however, able to provide education to their children. While many of us in our group are, are first-generation college students, we give our gratitude to our families for being able to provide all the opportunities that they did not have. To us, they get the sense of the education experience. Our cultural product is called Our Stories and Our Words. Um, which is a short clip of each group member sharing how they relate to the topic compiled into a video. While each clip is relatively short, they are powerful and eye-opening and showcasing how we have been impacted by immigration and or education. The impact of immigration and education is something I relate to heavily. My parents immigrated to the U.S. in the late 80s, early 90s to give their children a better life and better their future. I am proud to say I'm their fourth child to attend university. When my parents were immigrants, they came to this country when they were both 20 years old. And since they've been here, they've always worked hard to give me and my siblings everything that we've ever wanted. So far, I'm going to be the first one in my family to graduate from college. And it's an important achievement because it signifies that everything that they've done for us was in the name of a greater good. Immigration and education played a huge role in my family's life. My parents immigrated to the U.S. when they were 15 years old in hopes of giving their children a better life. Thanks to them, me and my sisters have had the opportunity to attend the university. We would have never had this opportunity if they had stayed in Mexico. I heavily relate to the themes of immigration and education, and I specifically relate to the theme of immigration because my mom immigrated to this country uh, when she was pregnant with me to give me a better life and my family's immigration status affects our everyday today life. And the reason I can relate to the education is because I'm a first generation student, I'm in college and I'm trying to get a bachelor's degree and motivate others along the way to do the same. My parents migrated from Guatemala. Back in the country, they never got education. My mom worked at a comedor and my dad was a soldado. Coming to the US, they were able to provide that to my sisters and I. Now I'm proud to say I'll be the first one the impact of immigration and education is something that I really relate to because my parents immigrated to the U.S. and leave everything behind in order to give my siblings and I a better chance at education and with great pride I say that I am their second child to attend university. My mother immigrated to the United States with nine children. She wanted to have a better life for us. As an immigrant, we face many struggles such as discrimination and racism. But with the faith of God, we were able to overcome all those struggles. We became American citizens and we have better education. Um, now I'm glad to say that I am the first one in my family to be in Cal State LA. Now we're, we'll talk about the analysis of the video of our stories and our words. In most cases, immigration and education go, in, go hand in hand. Our cultural product, our stories and our words demonstrates how these themes are prominent in the lives of many. We are each sharing how we have been impacted by immigration and our education in our own individual forms, illustrating examples and experiences that coincide to that of empowerment and resistance. In our video, three major themes emerged, those being the American dream, immigration, and the journey of pursuing our higher education. These things have been um, very prominent material that has been presented in the class through lectures, reading material, assignments, and discussions. Uh, some uh, reading materials that a lot of people related to, specifically in the group, was The Distance Between Us by Reina Grande and I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter by Erika Sanchez. 
And all the material as well as this project has assisted in one way to another, or another to deepen the understanding of deep-rooted issues and common experiences shared within our communities. Um, our group came to a collective agreement on creating a video for our cultural product. We had discussed several other options such as memes and TikToks, a few other things, but we decided that it would be best to make a video. We wanted to, we wanted our cultural product to be as personal as possible while staying on topic. Our ultimate goal was to showcase the importance of sharing our experiences with one another, a concept presented in class numerous of times. We want to build a sense of a community in our product, as well as to assure our classmates that we all have stories and it is important to listen and to share them all. To conclude our presentation, here are some reasons why families migrate to another country and the impact it has on them. To escape violence, whether it's war related or gang related, poverty, many families struggle with finding good paying jobs, which affects their housing situation, their children's education and development. When migrating to the US, they have better job opportunities such as better paying jobs and the opportunity to further their education. For example, in every state, there are several university options as well as trade schools and can sometimes even be free with the government's assistance. And even if school isn't for them, there are plenty of jobs where you receive promotions and you can work your way up to a better position, meaning there's room for more growth. Healthcare availability, some health issues can be very expensive and might require immediate assistance. Overall, they just want to give their kids a better future. We all believe that everyone deserves a high quality of life. Um, here are some of the sources that we have um, talked about through our presentation, and thank you so much for listening. All right, excellent snaps and applause and all that stuff. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Great work. Let's hop into marriage interracial families. Hi, this is our presentation and we chose marriage interracial families. So for the first slide, we have the short history of, we have the short history of interracial marriage relationships, which have had very different laws in the United States um, when compared to 75 years ago. Interracial marriages have been legal since 1967, which is both surprising, but not a huge shock. But before this, it was considered a felony offense to marry or date someone from a different race. In the picture on the right, it features Pearl Bailey and Louis Belson, who got married in 1952 and found their greatest acceptance was with the Republican Party, which Pearl Bailey remained in. In the Supreme Court ruling Loving versus Virginia, it was ruled that not allowing people from distinct races get married was a violation of the 14th Amendment. Since the 1960s, over 17 million people are a part of an interracial union. And for the next slide, we have Giselle Meron, who is going to present opinion shifting to the years. Back in the earlier days, people viewed interracial marriages as a crime. For example, in the 1960s, people were prohibited to marry other races. Since many people were against this idea, various states passed laws which banned interracial marriages, just like the state of Virginia. Today, people are more accepting towards interracial marriages and even believe that this will create a more diverse society. People believe that it will help learn about different cultures, practices, and beliefs. However, today there's still a great number of people who are against the idea of interracial marriages. This is because they don't want their traditions to change, um, also racism, etc. Um, Monica Herrera will share the pros and cons now. Thank you. Hello. So for pros and cons in regards to interracial marriages, some of them, some pros consist of acceptance of new culture. When you are in an interracial marriage, you are with someone that is different from your race. So you are accepting the new culture. You're also breaking stereotypes. There are many stereotypes when having an interracial marriage and many individuals that are in those marriages 
tend to seek out of the color of the partner's skin. There's also diversity in genetics for their future children. And then there's also a personal growth because you, like I previously mentioned, you're breaking your stereotypes. So you're allowing yourself to be open-minded and accepting and being confident. And then another pro is um, fighting against racism. There are a lot of individuals who believe that it is wrong to be dating out of your race and you should only stick within your race. So you're beating the odds of, you know, their criticism. But although some cons consist of unsupportive families, those individuals who believe that you should only be dating within your race are most of the time your personal critics are your own family. There will be a lot of um, individuals who will make your relationship a much bigger deal than what it is. People, like I said, will criticize, they'll over-exaggerate, and they'll just be stereotyping you. Um, a third con is children. Um, a lot of the children will discriminate, will be discriminated against. You know, they will be judged. If, for example, um, a lot of kids that I know who are mixed with black and white, if they really look white, they will be they will be told like, oh, you're not black, you're not black, you're just white, and you know, talk down about. Um, you will be living a life with constant criticism, and then you'll also be stared at. For me personally, I have a white boyfriend, so I always get a lot of stares, and it honestly is very offensive. But I've learned to just become confident with it through my interracial um, relationship. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Valeria Contreras um, and I'm going to be talking about the facts or statistics of interracial families. Um, it was found that there was a 39% rate of Americans who believed that marrying someone from a different race or ethnicity could be um, good for a society. Um, another point uh, that was found was that in the year for 2000, the percentage of married coupled households was at 7.4% and it grew to 10.2% from the years of 2012 to 2016, which was um, in the US. There's two, I included two specific um, ethnicities or races here, uh, which is for Hispanics, newly with men, 26% um, have a spouse from different ethnicities or race. And then for African-Americans, 18% marry someone of a different race or ethnicity. Overall, in the, U in the US interracial marriages statistics uh, shows that there's 10% of the population that are currently in mixed race unions. So now um, I'll pass it on to Steven Gonzalez, who will be uh, talking about our cultural product. For our cultural product, we decided to make three memes because we thought we could uh, encapsulate our thoughts the best with those. For this first meme, it reads, all the problems in the world and you're mad my parents don't match. Uh, with this first meme, we saw a lot of themes and the themes that we came up with were family and ignorance. In our lives, a lot of us had family members who would judge us for you know, dating outside of our race and we all thought that was pretty ignorant. Next slide, slide, please. For our next meme, it reads, when you tell your old relatives that you're dating someone of a different race and it's them being shocked, like you what? Uh, for this one, we also saw themes of family and ignorance. When we talked, we realized that a lot of our older relatives were the ones who were judging us for dating outside of our race. Finally, we have the last meme. And this one says, when your family accepts your partner, no matter their race, and it's DJ Khaled saying, you're very smart. The themes in this one were family, knowledge, and acceptance. We thought it was important to bring together uh, a good ending to this. You know, there are a lot of families who will accept you for whoever you're dating, no matter what, just because they support you. Um, for the next topic, it will be Americo, and he will be talking about our oral history. So for our oral history, Trinice learned to be grateful and appreciate family. Monica learned about the hardships about coming to the United States. Giselle learned how families tear up during immigration situations. Valeria learned about the journey and the challenges. 
Stephen learned about his family history. Ivan learned the statistic, the sacrifices their family endured, and I learned the importance of family. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, a mother's love is uncomparable to a, any other love. Everyone in our group interviewed their mother or grandmother. The sacrifice of a mother has to endure and the hardship she faces is still provide the love a child need, it's unmatched. All the women interviewed had one main thing in common. They all loved their family so much that they put their family before themselves. Ivan Villagran will present the conclusion. So in conclusion to our presentation on interracial marriage and couples, um, we came to the conclusion that the perspective on interracial marriage is constantly changing and people's opinions are often influenced by the way that they were raised coming from their grandmother or their parents. And even when, when an interracial marriage is accepted, um, they still face their own uh, problems and cons in society. And uh, this topic is important because it contributes to society because it's creating a more diverse society. And um, the humor behind our means is that the ignorance that people have when and their perspective that they have when they find out that someone is getting into an interracial marriage or creating a couple that's outside of their race. And a result of society changing and the number of interracial families, and it has grown in the past years and it will only continue to grow. And overall, people need to be accepted regardless of who they choose to marry, regardless of their race or what culture you come from. And that's our presentation. All right, excellent, wonderful snaps and applause and all that good stuff. Thank you so much, wonderful, wonderful. Let's move to our final group, right? I know we're moving into like 109, right? But let's be patient and let's go ahead and make sure we finalize for this. So let's go ahead and hop to street families. You're bringing it home for us. Okay, so our presentation is on street families and kinship. My name is Alexis and I'll be talking about gang families. Um, so in these photos, it is my husband and his friends who are gang members. Uh, they have formed a kinship through gangs. A lot of them share the same struggles and hardships of uh, growing up in unstable uh, households. They didn't all have the same living situation as far as with their parents. Some grew up in single parent households. Some grew up in a household with two parents, but the parents were either druggies, alcoholics, or abusive. And some grew up with no parents at all. Uh, because of the way they grew up in their household, they all grew a bond together through their gang and shared the same interest. To tie this slide to the course, I used the text um, Tattoos on the Heart by Gregory Boyle that states, <clears throat> it is safe to declare that as a teenage growing up in LA, it would have been impossible for me to join a gang. Uh, for these guys, they grew up in Boyle Heights and chose to live the gangbanging lifestyle. And sadly, out of all the guys in these photos, one of them is dead, one got deported, the rest are in prison. And out of all of them, my husband is the only one who changed his lifestyle and is living life freely. Hi, my name is Christian. And an example of kinships is Homeboy Industries. Homeboy Industries was made for gang members who wanted to move away from the gang life. And it did that by helping them like create new relationships with other former gang members. It gave them second chances and helped them rehabilitate. And an example of this was in Tattoos of the, in Tattoos of the Heart, where Gregory Boyle mentions that someone came like asking him for help and get a job. But he mentioned that he didn't know how, how to do anything other than shank someone in prison. But even though he didn't really know how to do anything, he still gave him a job the very next day. Sorry, who's supposed to be doing this slide? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't unmute my mic. I'm sorry. I thought I unmuted it. My bad. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Johnny Gutierrez, and I'll be talking about comadrascos. It's a kinship between, um, got, um, through 
godparenthood, so the godparents and so on. So it started off between Native Americans and Spanish women as they would baptize sickly or stillborn babies. But however, it evolved to be something much more where they, they would talk about social issues, problems between their own families. It created this sisterhood between women. As the picture shown, that's my mom and her comadre. Even though she moved um, across the country, they still talk, make time for each other, and they talk about their problems and help each other out. And they know that they have that one person always that they could count on. And then this also led to different social movements as well. It led to um, the women involvement in Chicano student movements in the 1960s and 1970s. It addressed social injustices within their communities and it allowed women to find a community where they couldn't find it before. Um, yeah. All right, so my name is Jesus Alcazar and the kinship I'll be talking about, it's grandparents. This kinship is more, you're born into it because an immediate type of, you're blood related to your grandparents. And the, the case that I used was uh, Reina Grande and the distance between us, where these are the, the images provided are, are her grandparents, which she mentions in the book. And what's, what's special about um, Reina's situation is that her, her grandparents actually stepped in and substituted as her parents once her father and, and mother left to El Otro Lado for, to complete the American dream. And I feel like the connection that she had with her parents will obviously differ from the connection that she has with her grandparents after they left. And that's what makes this kinship special. Uh, this quote that I, that, I, that, I, that I chose states, he and Juana chose to leave their children behind. Abuela Ival said that she cleaned, said as she cleaned the beans, I didn't ask for this. Look at me. I'm 71 years old. Do I look like I need to be taking care of three young children on top of the one I'm already looking after? So she wasn't obligated to, to take care of the children because they're obviously her grandchildren, but she did it because of the, the blood connection that she has and knowing that if she didn't take care of them, who would? And I feel like this type of, this type of situation is very common in our Chicano culture over the last few years as, as families go to, to well, come to the US and try to send back help and bring for their children. The children live with the grandparents. And yeah, this is, this is a kinship I talked about. Hi, my name is Ashley and I'll be speaking on the sibling kinship. Sibling kinship is a pure type of kinship in general, or at least in my case, I have two older siblings, which are in the picture to the side. Um, in most cases, the older sibling is the caring and responsible sibling who is the parent, who is like the par parent. Um, in the book, The Distance Between Us, Reina and her sibling went through the hardship of their parents leaving them um, uh, back, leaving them behind. Um, and in this case, Mago was the sibling who takes the mantle of being the parent to Reina, considering that she was the oldest. And in the book, uh, Mago said, just because they aren't with us doesn't mean we don't have parents anymore. Meaning Mago was the one who took care of Reina. She took the initiative of justifying their parents' shortcomings and her, their roles of being a sibling. Um, hi, I'm Annabelle Garcia, and I will be talking about who did um, what oral history projects. And um, Jennifer interviewed her best friend, who is an indigenous queer woman. Alexis interviewed her grandmother, who was born in Tijuana, Mexico, and migrated to the U.S. at the age of two through a visa. I interviewed my boss, who was a Cuban woman who migrated to Florida. Jesus interviewed his maternal grandfather who migrated from his hometown in Nayarit, Mexico to provide for his family. Ashley interviewed her, her mother who was born in Oaxaca, Mexico and migrated to the US to provide for her family financially. Christian interviewed his mother who was born in Guanajuato, Mexico who came to the US to help out her family. And Giovanni interviewed his mom who was born in Oaxaca, Mexico and she came to the US looking for a better life.
So for our, oh, my name is Jennifer Michelle and for our cultural project, we um, made a collage. In the backgrounds, we included the places that we grew up in because um, we feel like the they shape who you become and also like the types of kinships that you make and with who you make them. Um, and the people that we chose in the pictures are either our families or our friends that are like family. And those people also shape who we become because we grow from learning from other people and the places where you grow grew up grow up in um shape like how you perceive the world and how you see things I also added a picture of Cal State LA in the background because that's what brought us together to work on this project as like a school kinship and uh, friends and family can provide a space where you can feel safe and fit in and um the bottom two pictures in the middle those are the one most at the bottom is who I interviewed um my friend Jocelyn and then the other one it's my me and my friend Jade and we're really close and I see them as sisters and then oh then we're just gonna present like who who's in each picture uh, my photos are the ones right in the middle. So the top one, it's me and my comadre. She baptized both of my kids. And then the bottom one, it's my immediate family, my mother, my stepfather, all of my siblings, my husband, and my uh, two kids. Um, my picture is the one on the top left. And it's just me and my friends who I've known for a very long time. Um, for me, it's the most bottom left one. Um, me and my friends playing golf. I known them over 15 to 10 years, each one of them. I'm the only child, so I consider them my brother because they always been there for me and I always try to be there for them. Uh, my pictures are the ones on the right side, the middle, in the middle of the, the screen. And those are some of my cousins and uncles that, that we together see each other like brothers. This is actually a a trip that we took to Mexico all together and we're over there because we were super close. Um, my pictures are right next to the South LA where I grew up. Um, the top one is me and my dad where he raised me and I will forever be grateful for what he's done for me. And then the the second one is me and my best friend um, who I've known for since elementary and she's like a sister to me. And my, my picture is on the bottom right corner, and it's my immediate family, which are my two sisters and my brother. I am the youngest of four. And then it's my parents, and we're in front of the um, Watts Towers. And I put my immediate family because we're really close and united, and we consider each other's best, best friends. Yeah, that concludes our presentation. All right, excellent. Let's give snaps, applause, and all that good stuff. Thank you so much, Street Families. And thank you to each and every one of you for your contributions in the group. As you can see, each group has, you know, unique perspectives and experiences that they've been seeing. I think many of you put so much work into the cultural products and, and it really, really shows. So thank you so much for the wonderful research that, that you contributed on behalf of this class.